morning, church. Welcome to worship. As you guys are taking your seats, the psalmist says, I wait expectantly for you. How many of you guys are expectant this morning? We should be expectant. Anytime we gather together as believers, the word of God is preached. It says that his word doesn't return void, so we should be expectant, right? Man, well, I hope you're expectant. Just pray with me if you would as we begin to worship. God, Lord, our soul waits expectantly for you. Lord, we expect you to move and do only what you can do, God. Lord, we know your word doesn't return void. And we just claim that promise this morning. Lord, hear your people as we worship this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. If you would stand with us as we worship this morning.
name of Jesus. So we cry out to Christ alone because he has the power to save us.
the same God. You are the same God. You answered prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were providing then. You are providing now. You are the same God.
same God. The same God. I was thinking about that and how he spoke the universe into existence. <laughs> he spoke through the old prophets, the Old Testament prophets. He came to dwell with us, died on the cross for us, rose again. That's the same God that's right here, right now. Like, do we believe that? Are we numb to it? Scripture says in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Chris, Pastor Chris is going to get into this a lot more because there's a lot there. But I was thinking about the word abide for me personally and what that means. And it means to allow God to take up full residence in my life, right? Like when I accept him as my Savior, he lives in me. But that's kind of step one, abiding in him, allowing him to take full residence of my life. That, that's different, right? Dwelling in him. I actually woke up at 2 a.m. this morning, and y'all know that feeling when it's like you wake up and you're not going back to sleep, and it's the most frustrating thing, and naturally, I want to like go watch a cooking show or pick up my phone and scroll, because that kind of numbs it, right? And that's what we're trying to do when we fill our lives with those things. We're numbing ourselves. We don't want to be alone with our thoughts, but I remember thinking, like I had to stop myself and say, no, I'm going to I'm gonna do that. I know I was going to talk to you guys about this. I'm, like, I'm going to do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dwell in, in God. Like, I was able to pray for my husband and my kids and my family and my friends and the direction our family's going. And that's nourishing for our souls, right? There's a lot of things out there that we, we do that nourish us on the surface, but not like deep in our soul. Like God says we, just like the fruit is doesn't exist apart from the vine, we can't live this, we can't run this race well without being a part of God. And I think it's looks different for everyone. It's at 2 a.m. not grabbing my phone, but dwelling with him, right? Talking to him when I'm in my car, when I have a few minutes in the shower. Maybe it's cranking up some music, worship music instead of your favorite playlist one day because your soul needs that more while you clean or mow the lawn. So I just want, I, I know I'm going to, and I just ask that you guys join me in really looking at that this week. What does it mean to dwell in the Lord? And we're going to take a few moments to do that and I'll close us in prayer. God, you are so good. We are so grateful that you are here in this building among us all the time. God, help us never forget that, never grow numb to it, never want to numb our minds and just move forward with the time, but dwell in what you have for us, God. The enemy wants us, especially once we're already saved, he wants to take away that relationship. He wants to ruin us living our life to the fullest in what you have planned for us. And God, help us find those moments to recalibrate our lives, to constantly be in communion with you and to abide in you, give you full residence in our lives in all ways. God, we love you. We thank you for all that you've given us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, just take a few moments. Tell someone right around you how good God is. Well, as you make your way back to your seats, we know that school started for everyone now. I believe everyone's back in school, whether that's exciting for you or not. And um, with that, lots of things, of course, are kicking back off. If you joined us this summer, I know some people <laughs> that joined this summer and they're like, nothing's going on. I get it. Like, we kind of stop things in the summer. 
But everything's kicking back off, and that includes none other than, none other than mops. And mom's next. Christy and I go way back. We've done mops for years. You've been the coordinator now for years. Um, it kicks back off mops and mom's next. So this is Christy. She's the coordinator. We're going to let her have a moment. Tell them what mops mom's next is if they've never heard of it, and maybe what a typical meeting is like. Hi, everyone. So this will be our eighth year of Mops and Moms Next, which is super exciting. Uh, I think that's the record that we've held for here at New Hope. So that's, woo. Um, so a couple years ago, post pandemic, um, we started as just Mops, which stands for Mothers of Preschoolers. So it was geared toward mothers who were pregnant or had a child zero to five years old. Then the pandemic happened, and we realized more than ever, us ladies needed some communication time with each other, and we needed community. So we opened it up to Moms Next, which now serves first-time pregnant moms through, if you have kids, to, um, up to 18 years old. So all children. Um, this also includes if you are a foster parent or a step parent, if you are the primary caretaker of a grandchild, um, a step parent, um, an adoptive mom. Um, this includes if you are first time pregnancy and you don't have a baby on the outside quite yet. Um, so we gather twice per month. We have a meeting the second Tuesday of every single month, um, September through May, and we eat dinner. We gather um, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. We do have childcare for those that might be new to town and not have other options because we never want to keep people from coming because they don't have childcare. So um, we eat dinner together. We have discussion around our tables. Um, we do crafts. Um, it's honestly just an opportunity to gather moms, build each other up. Um, iron sharpens iron, so uh, we just, and Mop's whole motto is Better moms make a better world. So we're just there to encourage each other, um, fill everybody with a little bit of Jesus, and give them that encouragement that they need to get through motherhood. Um, and you start this week, next week, right? Or this week? 12th, next week. Okay, so you've got plenty of time to put that in your calendars, ladies. Um, but what do they need to do if they want to join? So September 12th, Tuesday, first meeting, our second event that we do every month is a mom's night out, which is just super fun. Maybe you've seen some photos over the years. We do tea parties and dress up as old ladies and go bowling and like super, super fun. There's always food involved. Um, but to be a part of Mops, you just show up. We have a setup out in the lobby. It's here. We generally meet in the fellowship hall, but we set up in the lobby. We greet you at the door. We get you placed at a table. Um, it's super laid back and fun and um, not intimidating at all. So you are more than welcome to contact me, my name and numbers up on the screen, um, or just show up and we are going to get you plugged in with someone. We're going to build friendships and um, that last a lifetime. Honestly, most of my friends have come from up. So yeah. Awesome. And honestly, you guys don't let it intimidate you. I know it sounds like a lot to just show up, right? But these are the most welcoming group of women you'll ever meet, and I can't encourage you enough. And they, you have a Facebook page, too. They can look you up. Yep. New Hope Mops. I think it's on there. Yes, it is. QR code will take you to their Facebook page, so you can just keep up to date. Even if you want to watch, but don't watch. Just, just join. Okay. But All right. Thank you, Christy. You'll be around if they have any questions, right? All right. Thank you. <laughs> and with Mops starting back, of course, we also have a youth group starting back. Let me make sure I get those details right. We have middle school. It's a little different. And middle school and high school is going to be together on Wednesday night. So it's going to be really fun for the kids and the leaders. Have one big night together where they kind of start, do some things together and do some things separate. But that is starting Wednesday. That's this Wednesday at 7 p.m. right here at New Hope. So if your kids have never gone, if they haven't tried it out this summer, I just encourage you um, to encourage them to get there. So if you're in middle school or high school, Join us, okay? Join us Wednesday night, 7 p.m., and it's Family Sunday, so we welcome all of you kiddos. We're so glad that you're here. Plenty of stuff in the back for you, um, and yeah, it's going to be a good morning. No middle school. Sorry, guys. We love having you in here, though. All right. Pastor Chris.
I'm just going to let you preach this message. That was awesome, by the way. Mm. Man, it's great to see you guys this morning. Hey, before we get rolling, though, uh, just a quick bit of of family business. And uh, so if you are visiting this morning, if you're new to New Hope, uh, maybe it's even your first Sunday, just kind of do this this morning, all right? Because uh, this is really for our, our, our members and our regular attenders. Just kind of want to let you know where we're at. And I don't do this very often because I hate talking about this stuff, but just let you know where we're at financially right now. Uh, so right now we're about uh, $130,000 behind uh, our budget for the year. Our fiscal year ends the end of October, so we begin a new one uh, in November. We're looking at making some pretty substantial cuts uh, this next year, and you know I think a lot of us have had to do that. We've really had to look at our budgets and say, okay, uh, you know what? What's really important? What uh, what can we uh, can we sacrifice? And so we're we're definitely doing that for this next year. So just ask that you be praying for us. Um, we're about uh, ten thousand dollars into our reserve funds so far for the year. We usually keep uh, about ten percent of our budget in the bank. Right now we're we're already into that for the year, and so uh, we hate doing that, but that's kind of kind of where we're at right now. So. Uh, yeah, if you're a regular uh, contributor, uh, you tithe regularly, you give regularly, just thank you so much. Don't stop, okay? And uh, yeah, if you haven't uh, participated in that, just encourage you to, to, uh, to pray about that and just maybe ask God, what would you have me do? We've got offering boxes at the back. Uh, you can go to our website and uh, you can click uh, give on the give button there and, and uh, do that through that. But yeah, just to let you all know, we've got a, again, we've got a new budget coming up. We'll be talking about that at the end of uh, October. And so that's, I probably won't talk about this very much. You've got the numbers in the bulletin, and, and occasionally you'll get a letter from me, but just to let you know. All right? All right. <laughs> Not a great way to start. This is like the, most, the worst way to start a message, right? But uh, it is what it is. Father, thank you this morning. God, we trust you because we know that you are good. God, as we look back on our lives, God, we see your faithfulness. We see how you've blessed us. God, I don't, I know, I don't always get exactly what I want, but Father, over and over and over, you give me exactly what I need. And so, uh, Father, just thank you for, for being the one who provides uh, for us. So, God, we trust you. Uh, we trust you uh, with our finances here at the church. God, we trust you with our finances at home. God, we trust you with our families. God, every decision that we make, uh, we want to make to glorify and honor you because we know that you're faithful. And so, Father, thank you again for the morning and just the opportunity to, to be together as a family and to love on one another and, God, to talk about what it means to abide in you. So, God, thank you. Pray it all in your son Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. All right. All right. Well, again, just, uh, don't you know, I, mean, I, love, I love being here. I love seeing you guys this morning. I uh, love this series that we've been in. Uh, so we started out talking about the seven signs of uh, Jesus, the seven miracles in the book of John, and then uh, now we've been tackling the seven I am statements of Jesus. There's just lots of overlap, right? in those statements, because uh, the miracles of Jesus, the I am statements of Jesus, they all point towards Jesus' identity, who he was, and where he's leading us into life. And so all of these statements, all the miracles, they all kind of, uh, kind of coalesce and overlap to kind of emphasize those things. And so today we're in our very last uh, sermon in this series, and then we're going to take a little break for a couple weeks, and then we're going to be uh, into a new series that, uh, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about later, but uh, kind of excited about what's coming up next for us. Let's, uh, let's do this. Let's read for one last time. These are the seven I am statements of Jesus. Read these out loud together with me. You ready? Jesus said, I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the gate for the sheep, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, and the life, the true vine. And that's what we're going to tackle 
this morning. So if you were here last week, uh, in John chapter 14, Jesus and the disciples, right, they had been taking the Passover meal together, and Jesus had been giving the disciples kind of some final instructions. He reminds them that he's going to prepare a place for them in heaven, and the way to this place is through him. So he tells them, don't let your hearts be troubled, but be sure to keep your eyes on the big picture. All right. I love that. God gives us over and over that encouragement, right? Keep your eyes on the big picture. I was talking to somebody uh, just this last week. They're doing a study in the book of Revelation. And, you know, a lot of times we read through the book of Revelation, we get caught up in all the details. But I think God's intention as you read through the book of Revelation as complicated as it, as it can be, the, the theme of that book is we win, right? In the, in the end, God triumphs over evil. He restores uh, his intended uh, place for us and uh, brings us to himself. In the end, we win. So Jesus says, keep your eyes on the big picture. And so at the end of chapter 14, Jesus says, get up. Let's leave this place. So they leave the upper room where they've been having the Passover meal, and they start out across Jerusalem to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray where Jesus will be betrayed by Judas and then arrested by the temple guard. So as they're walking, Jesus knew that the disciples would be uh, very soon, they would be kicked out of the temple they would be barred from the synagogue, and they would be ostracized from participating in the life that they had grown up in, right? For, for a Jew uh, going to the temple and making sacrifice and, and all these things, like this is what life centered around. And soon they would be ostracized from that life. And as they pass by the temple, perhaps Jesus, as, as they're walking that night, perhaps Jesus is reminded in that moment of, of the vines, right, that adorn uh, the, the area above the doors to the temple. And Jesus says this to his disciples in John 15. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes, and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, whatever, ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. So as they're going, Jesus kind of, he changes gears a little bit, right? And so instead of talking about the hope of heaven, he starts talking a little bit about help here on earth, how will the disciples bear the weight of what they are about to face? How will they fulfill the mission that Jesus has for them to go into all of the world and tell them what they have been taught by Jesus? How will they find the strength to stand firm as this band really kind of of misfits, uh, misfit followers of Jesus uh, as they grow uh, this church, this new thing to encompass really the entire known world and eventually touch every corner of the globe. Like, how, how will they do that? How will this group of guys that just, you know, they're, they're just a few minutes ago were arguing about who's going to sit at Jesus' left and right hands? I think the answer that Jesus gave to the disciples was as true for them as it is for us today. How do you stand under the pressures of life? How do you be salt and light in a world that is, man, they, our world is so desperate for a little bit of hope. How do you participate in God's family, do your part in building up your brothers and sisters in Christ? 
Jesus gives us the answer here to those questions in John 15. If you want to experience an abundant life, remain in Christ. Right? Earlier, Jesus talked about the abundant life. Remember, he, he said, I am the gate for the sheep. And he says that, that he came to provide a life and life abundantly for his sheep. That's us. That's his intention, that we experience this abundant life. And here Jesus says, look, if you want to experience this abundant life that I have for you, then remain in me. Some translations say, abide in me. In verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. So why does he say in verse 1, I am the true vine? Well, again, the, the vine was used frequently uh, in imagery to symbolize Israel. It was on their coins. Uh, it was extensive in their literature. Uh, you'll find the book of Isaiah especially. Uh, lots of uses, uh, references to Israel as the vine. And again, above the temple door, there's this ornate carving of a vine as you head into the temple of Solomon. So when Jesus refers to himself as the true vine, he's taking an image for Israel and applying it to himself. Jesus himself is the true Israel. Israel's place as the people of God is now taken by Jesus and his disciples. They are the new vine and its branches. It's not a re it's not a rejection of Judaism, but it's a fulfillment of Judaism. Remember last week I said that Jesus is the physical fulfillment of every promise that God has made. Every promise that he's made to us is fulfilled in Christ. And now the people of God identify not with a nation or with a territory, but with Jesus. And the new people of God are composed not just of Jews, but uh, of uh, people from every tribe, every corner of the globe. In verse 2, he says, Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. So what kind of, kind of images come to mind when you read that verse? I'll be honest, like that verse always scared me a little bit, <laughs> all right? I, I don't know that I, I always really understood exactly what Jesus was saying there. It kind of brought these images of an angry God, kind of carving things out of my life that he deemed a hindrance uh, to my producing fruit. But, and I want you to track with me here, all right, because we're going to get just a little bit into the weeds. Uh, but I think some of that misunderstanding comes from what I feel like is maybe a poor translation of some of the words here. So let me explain that. Jesus said, every branch of me that does not produce fruit, he removes. Uh, the word translated removes in verse 2 is arrow, all right? Uh, a word in which there are really three, and you can go ahead and go to that next slide, Doug. Put that up early there, all right? This word arrow is a word which uh, has three, has four definitions, all right, in the Greek lexicon. Uh, those definitions are to, to raise up, to pull up, uh, or to lift up, and then the fourth definition being to remove, all right? So arrow, this word, when Jesus says remove, uh, is, is used in John eleven forty one, 41, where Jesus lifts up his eyes uh, to heaven, and again in Luke 17, when the people lifted their voices. Uh, thus, the idea here is not to remove, but to lift up. Now, track with me. And then it says, he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. The word translated prunes is kathero. Uh, it's where we get our word for catharsis. All right, which is kind of a, it refers to kind of this emotional cleansing process. All right, kathero uh, literally means to cleanse or to wash or to purify. Kathero is used in John 13 when Jesus washes the feet of his disciples. 
If, in fact, in, in virtually every single place in the New Testament, kathero is, is translated not prune, but cleanse. So I believe the use of the word prunes here in John 15 is, is a poor translation. If you put these thoughts together, you get, I think, an understanding of what Jesus is really saying here. And, and it's really a beautiful A beautiful idea. He says, Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he lifts up and he cleanses every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he lifts up and he cleanses every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. Right? In, in vineyards, right, this is a very common practice. When, 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 the, when the gardener right, uh, finds a branch that is, is resting in the dirt, right, he'll, he'll take that branch and he'll tie it up so that it's not touching the ground. And if there's fruit then that is, is kind of in the dirt, in the mud, he'll take that fruit and he'll gently cleanse it and, and wash it lovingly, caringly, tenderly. And so Jesus paints a picture not of God, you know, lopping you off or, or, or cutting you up, all right? But of him cleansing you. How do I know this for sure? Look at the next verse in verse 3. Jesus says then, you are already clean, same Greek word as above, because of the word I have spoken to you. If you follow Jesus' analogy here, what Jesus is saying is I lift the downtrodden branch, I wash the contaminated fruit. How? Through the Word. You are clean through His Word. How do you bear more fruit? Not by the Lord butchering you or bloodying you, but by being in the Word. How do we get our lives cleaned up? How does more fruit come? Fruit comes by a commitment to his word and openness to his word and by staying in his word. The psalmist says the same thing in Psalm 119 when he said, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping your word. Paul picks up the same analogy in Ephesians chapter 5 where he talks about husbands and wives. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. So Jesus gives us an important set of instructions when he says, I am the true vine, you are the branches. When you're downcast or dirty, the Father will come and pick you up and wash you off when you spend time in his word. When you spend time in his word in your morning devotions or your online Bible study or your small groups, being in a place where the word is taught, you know, we begin to, to see our lives based on what Jesus says has a cleansing effect on us. Verse 4, he says, Remain in me and I in you, just as the branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. Stay close to me, Jesus says. Remain in me, cling to me. This is important if you want to understand the abundant life remain in Christ. And when we remain in Christ, our lives will produce fruit. It's the natural result, Jesus says. Well, what is this fruit that Jesus is talking about? Here's a, a small, limited list, right? The scripture's full of, of, of what it ta- what it, of talking about fruit. Romans chapter 1, verse 13, John 4, identify fruit as winning lost souls, right? Talking to people about Jesus, Romans 6 defines fruit as holiness. Romans 15 names generosity as a fruit. Colossians chapter 1 describes fruit as helping people 
in practical ways. Hebrews 13 tells us that the fruit of our lip, lips, giving praise to his name. That's fruit. Worship essentially is fruit. Galatians 5, chapter 22, teaches that the fruit of the Spirit is love. Right? All of those fruits that list there are really characteristics of the one fruit of the Spirit, and that is love. Love is the ultimate fruit. Fruit is the result of remaining in Christ and our response to His Word. It's one thing simply, right, to hear God's Word. It's another thing entirely to respond to God's voice. So when your life is filled with love, when you're being generous, when you're worshiping the Lord verbally, when you're doing good things practically, all of these things, Jesus say, says, constitute fruit. What does the abundant life God has for you look like? It is a life that is producing fruit, and that happens when we remain in Him or abide in Him, when we cling to Him, when we intertwine our lives, like uh, Trista was saying this morning. How do we fill our, our lives up with Him? Verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. So we, we've lived in our house on Moore Street for 20 years now. And uh, we have this apricot tree in our backyard that was, I'm pretty sure, is original to the house. It was built 50 years ago. This is a really old apricot tree. We, I, we love this tree. Until it starts to drop a lot of fruit, fruit on the ground, right? And then that just kind of sucks. But we, we love this tree because it is so prolific. Man, it produces so many apricots every single year. It's awesome. Well, this year, uh, the tree is older, right? And so it's really, it, it started to show its age a little bit. And one of the, the great big branches got so full of fruit, it actually broke and uh, went to the ground. And uh, so... What if I told you this morning, okay, man, this tree, this is an amazing tree. I'm going to take this branch that came off. I'm going to bring it to the church, and next year, we're going to have some amazing fruit here at New Hope. This, 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 because this tree is amazing, right? So I'm going to bring the branch. I'm going to put it in the lobby, and next year we are going to have apricots, right? Well, you'd think <laughs> that's silly, all right? Because if the branch is going to be, produce fruit, it has to be connected to the tree. And that's what Jesus, that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. We might know how we should act and all the things that we should do, but if we're not connected to Jesus, if we're distanced from him, if we are far away from him, we will never bear any fruit. We need to be in his presence every day and in his word regularly. If not, we'll cut off. Now listen to this. If we're not daily connected to him, we will cut off the flow of nutrients that would have produced fruit in our lives. If you choose to abide in him or remain in him, to intertwine your life with his to wrap yourself around him and stay close to him, your life, Jesus says, will produce much fruit. How is the fruit produced? By remaining. All right, and that's really, I think, kind of a, a key idea here. It's not struggling and it's not striving, but remaining in him. You know, every year I look out at the apricot tree. I don't see those branches, you know, uh, struggling and striving. Oh, we're, just, we're trying so hard to produce fruit. No, just every year they just stay connected to the tree, and every year they produce fruit. Those branches, as they hang in there day after week, after month, after year, when the right season comes, the blossoms come, and the apricots appear, all because it just hangs in there. And as we hang in there 
with Jesus, as the days turn into weeks, into months, into years, you will begin to see fruit, and then more fruit, and then much fruit, Jesus says. I heard a pastor say this one time. He said, great faith doesn't come out of great effort, but out of great surrender. Great faith doesn't come out of great effort, but out of great surrender. As we remain in Him, as we stay connected with Him, walking with Him daily, that's when our faith begins to grow. That's when the fruit begins to come. How important is this? If you look at verse 6, Jesus says, If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. That sounds ominous. All right, if you're new to relationship with Jesus, let me just assure you that Jesus is not talking about your salvation here. Jesus will never turn his back on you. God's word is clear about that. that your salvation is about what Jesus already did for you. It's not about what you do. And when you give your life to him, nothing can change your position as God's son or daughter. But if your life isn't producing any fruit, what value does it have, Jesus says. Your life is missing something critical and valuable, both to the kingdom of God and to your own life. The abundant life God has for us requires that there is some fruit in our life. That's how important this is. In verse 7, then he says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. If you're clinging to me, if your life is intertwined with mine, you can ask whatever you want and your prayers will be answered without exception, Jesus says. But there's this qualification all right, hope you caught that. If you remain in me and my words remain in you. And this is really, I think, the, the root of the problem with a lot of our prayers. James says this in James chapter 4. He says, you do not have because you do not ask, but when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives. In other words, our requests are out of line when we're not in God's word because we don't know how to pray. Prayer and his word go hand in hand. And as I'm in the word, his word remains in me. And it is then that I know how to pray and what to ask for. So if I, if I went to God today, all right, and I prayed and I said, God, we need some money for the church. We have missionaries to support. We've got, we've got new ministry ideas. I mean, we, we really want to be able to make payroll this month. All right, and I, and I said, God, we just need some money. So would you help me to find a big stash of cocaine? And then I'll go out and sell that. And then we'll have all the money that we need. Would, would you just do that, God? All right. What, what, do you, what do you think God's answer would be to that? No. I mean, obviously, it would be no. <laughs> because it's completely out of line with, with what his word says I should be doing. And, and the same is true for us, that when we pray, when, when, when his word permeates our heart and our lives, when, when, we're, when we remain in him and we're walking with him, then we begin to know and understand his heart, and we know how to pray and what to ask for. When our lives are intertwined with him and his word, we'll know exactly how to pray, and we'll begin to produce the kind of fruit that verse 8 says, God is glorified by you would think the challenge that Jesus gives to his disciples is to bear fruit. But that's not the challenge. Don't misunderstand what Jesus is saying here. The challenge is to remain in the vine. Jesus said, if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. If you focus on remaining or clinging to him, listen, the fruit will come. There will be a result. As you walk with him, as you cling to him, fruit 
will come because the life of the vine will become present in the branch. Because the life that, that, that comes from, from, from the trunk of the tree or, or, or the vine, it will become present in us. And you'll begin to see that and it will result in fruit. So your job, therefore, is to remain in Christ. The remaining in Him is where we engage in fellowship, relationship, and intimacy with Jesus. It's the difference between participating in a religion and having a relationship with Him. That's what Jesus wants, is He wants a relationship with you. He wants to know you. He wants to know your heart. He wants you to know His heart. If you focus on the fact that Jesus is the only true vine, your life will be so intertwined with Jesus, you won't be able to help but bear much fruit and find the abundant life Jesus offers. So we need to remember that remaining in the true vine is a daily discipline. It's something you do every single day. It's a daily practice. If you're relying on Sunday morning, okay, this, this time, which is great, I love this time, but if you're relying on this solely to stay connected to Jesus, all right, your, your, your vine, your branch is going to be sickly. It's going to wither. You need to stay connected to him daily. You thought maybe you would get out of here without a C.S. Lewis quote. Nope. Here it is. C.S. Lewis said, relying on God, has to start all over every day as if nothing has yet been done. Every day. Going to Him. Praying. Spending time in His Word. Intertwining your life with His. And I guarantee that you'll begin to see the fruit of that. Hang in there. Don't quit day after week after month after year and you will begin to see fruit that will will blow your mind so as we take communion this morning I'm going to ask the guys that are serving if if they would come on up just a, a couple of things as we as we take communion together this morning maybe you've walked with Jesus for a long time and you've, you, you've nurtured that relationship, just encourage you this morning, just ask him to take you deeper. Ask him to, to take you further than you've gone. Ask for more fruit, see where he takes you. Maybe this morning you're feeling disconnected and distant from him. This morning is a great time, just confess that, say, God, I know I've neglected our relationship. God, I know you love me. God, I want to know you more. Show me how to do that. Just take some time and and just go to him this morning. You know, when we find ourselves far from the Lord, it's not because he's moved, right? He's always there. He's always in the same place. It's us who moves. And so I ask him, what, what does that look like, Father? And how can I daily develop some some, some strategies, some things that will help me stay connected to you. If you need help with that, I'd love to help you. I know Pastor Tim would love to help you with that. I know any of the pastors here would love to help you kind of along your, your journey there. But I want to give you just a few minutes. Just talk to the Lord this morning. And uh, yeah, ask Him to go deeper. If, if, if you're already connected, if you're there, man, God, what do you have for me now? What's next? If you're feeling disconnected, Confess that and ask him to, to lead you in a new direction. All right, let's just take a few minutes. We'll just bow where you're at. And as the band plays, let's just take a few minutes.
so as Jesus and the disciples are there in the garden, the temple garden, they come and they arrest Jesus and then they torture him, take him before Pilate. He's beaten and eventually let out to be crucified. Jesus says, you know, my, nobody takes my life from me, but I freely give it. Also that we could know him and be connected to him, that he would be our life. So as we take communion together this morning, just be reminded, right, that, that his body was broken, his blood was shed so that we would have the life that we now enjoy. So here's, here's how we're gonna do this this morning again. Just a reminder, you can, uh, in a few minutes, you can stand and, and come up. Uh, if you're in these center sections, come up this middle aisle and uh, to one of these tables and then exit down that side aisle. If you're in the outside aisles, if you would go to one of the outs, very far outside aisles, come up and then exit down those, those same aisles. We'll try to avoid any collisions. All right. So will you stand with me? If, uh, it, and let me just say this too. If, you're, uh, if getting up and coming to the front is hard for you, stay seated. Just right where you're at. And one of the guys will come around. They'll kind of catch your eye. You kind of wave at them. And uh, they'll bring you the elements. So if it's hard for you to get up front, that is just fine. Just stay right where you're at. And uh, one of the guys is, uh, oh, that's Phil. Phil's going to come around and, and, uh, and provide those for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you. God, that you are our life. That God, you sustain us because of your presence in us. God, we want to know you more. God, we want you to take us further than we thought we could go. We want to see more fruit. And so God, just draw, draw us gently in. God, when, when we're feeling downtrodden and far away, Father, lift us up, clean us off, and draw us closer to you, I pray. Father, thank you for your body for sending your son that his body would be broken, that his blood would be shed for us. And we pray all of that in your son Jesus' name. Amen. You don't have to be a member here at New Hope to participate, to take communion. If you, uh, you love Jesus, then we just invite you to do that. So will not you come, and uh, the guys will serve you here up front. And hold on to those elements, and we'll take those together here in just a few minutes. Darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy day, my anchor holds within. See 
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand. Let's take the bread this morning and remember that it represents the body of Jesus broken for us. Let's take and eat. Let's take the juice, remembering that it represents the blood of Jesus shed for the remission of our sin. Let's take and drink. Father God, and again, it is just so good to be in your presence this morning and to remember what we have because of your presence. Father, thank you. Thank you that we can celebrate that. Thank you, Father, that nothing that comes against us will stand because you are greater than all. God, we trust you and love you and say thank you all in your son, Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen, amen. Well, thanks for being here this morning. Uh, we will take our fellowship fund uh, in the back uh, offering. If uh, This is kind of uh, something we do every time we, we take communion together. Uh, that fund goes to meet the needs of, of folks in our congregation, in our community that have some kind of unforeseen financial uh, hardships. And so if you want to contribute to that on your way out, the guys have got some little baskets back there. You can do that. Thanks for being here this morning. Love y'all. Have a great week.